Hi, everybody. Hi. Happy Friday. We made it to Friday. Crazy, huh? Well, today I have um, awesome guests, so I am going to grab her and jump her in so we can get straight to our conversation <sighs> and find ways to grow all together. So, hi, Lindsay. So let me grab my girl. Na, 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 na. Um, if you didn't see what I posted, um, Mimi is going to be joining me and we, um, I'm pretty honored to have her. She is so just amazing, but you will know, you will see. Hold on, let me gather. Hi, hi, she is, hi. Hi. <laughs> I'm so you? excited. I'm like, I made it on. <laughs> you, look, you look amazing. Oh, thanks. Thanks. Thanks so much. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm yeah. doing good. I mean, in the midst of yes. everything. Yes. Yeah. It's been, a, it's been a heavy week, but. But it's Friday. But it's Friday. And we're looking you know, out. I'm here. So yes. <laughs> that's, how I, that's how I kind of just skew it. I go, okay, it's a heavy right. week, but yeah, I'm here. Ebbs and, and flows. Continuing to follow this path. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. You're doing it gracefully. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm so glad that you were able to join me today because I think that you have so much knowledge and I've known you for a very long time. A very long time. I was thinking about that. I was like, actually, you know, this is this is a while now. It's a while. Like I remember when like Joseph was little and I was right. like, ah, it's been a it's been a journey traveled yeah. across the country and back. Exactly. And so, and so I kind of just thought you'd be the perfect person to to discuss parenting, I think right now in not only in this pandemic, but just with the awareness on minorities, we are realizing the disparities that different parents have and different access of privilege that they have. And I know you and I have both in, growing up have been um, people that have been in schools that in districts that were majority white yeah. and that's a difference yep. but now how how are you handling it to begin with as a parent dealing with this pandemic and schooling and well I'm so glad you even opened up this way because I need to just even start with a disclaimer that I've got two kids that are distance learning at home right now. So anything can happen behind me. I'm like there's two kids, there's a dog, there's a fish. So, you know, we're just going with the flow over here. Yes. But um, you know, I guess that's part of the experience right now is you know, we have been forced into a new state of flexibility. Mm -hmm. uh, a new state of patience and open-mindedness and pause and um, it, there's an opportunity to really reflect and I think when we make the most of it we come out more intentional mm -hmm. we you know like we yeah we're more more intentional but it's not easy yeah. it's just not easy um, it's been you know in many ways an overwhelming time and so I've found a lot of motivation to try to support you know parents at this time yeah <laughs> like that's you know that's something it's something I was doing a while ago my organization race class and parenting I started that about five years ago almost six years ago I remember. um but it's funny how things are you know you kind of get an idea and you get an inspiration and then there's the moment where it aligns with the need yes and so that's kind of where I am <laughs> right I, now I remember when you you started it and and I kind of I feel the same way about like you have an idea and it aligns like I always wonder like why did I choose country music and I'm like oh because there's now I'm in this moment of like racial reckoning yeah in country music and I'm like I needed to be there right. to be able to have the voice to exactly. help change it and I think you needed to be there to be able to be a teacher and um, give advice and also give encouragement to parents who I mean, we're not teachers right. and are right. in a situation that is not normal and is right. not, it has not happened before, right. like right. virtual learning. Even in the previous pandemic, 
we didn't no. have this modern technology, so it yep. was not the same. It was not the same. I'm like, it's not the same. Nope. Not the same. <laughs> nope. Nope. Um, <laughs> okay, I would ask you where where do you see the the disparities in coming into play with this distance learning? Like, are you noticing um, firsthand disparities towards different races of children, and also like nationally, have you noticed that difference? Well, I think um, what's interesting in our country in general, I tend to think that because of systemic bias, mm -hmm. right, we often conflate race and class. Okay. okay. Yeah. So I think that's, that's one issue is that there's a lot of conflating race and class, which is why I specifically called this race, class and parenting when I was starting it, because I yeah. think that there's a lot of, um, you know, race and class are linked in a way that they shouldn't be in an equitable society in our country. But a lot of the disparity is driven by economic okay. inequality. And because that disproportionately um, affects minorities, uh, then you have a disproportionate, uh, you know, outcome there that looks like race. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it looks like yeah. race, but it's really about, you know, economic access and different kinds of options that really aren't available to people who are in places of a little bit greater economic pr privilege. Okay. So we have seen a lot of um, people who are able to make adaptations or, you know, execute adaptations at this time, either working from home. I, I Gosh, I can't remember the exact statistic. It was early on uh, in the pandemic that I was reading an article about how many people um, and, you know, are able to uh, just change where they're working and work from home and still be at home to support what's going on with the learning. And again, that's a blind spot where you might not even recognize that that's a privilege. If you're yeah. self-employed or if you're, you know, a salaried employee, if you have some sort of job where you don't have to physically be there um, and you can be home, what, you know, and then your education and your access to technology and all of these other things are other layers to that. Um, yes. But, you know, those are the, the, the things that are creating additional challenges, and that's where that additional burden is. And I think as we move out of this, um, hopefully, you know, in the next six to 12 months with the dissemination of vaccine and yada, 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 um, we just are going to have to be very creative about how we can attend to these learning gaps um, mm -hmm. constructively. Yeah, I was, um, I have multiple friends that are teachers and one does teach in California in a lower socioeconomic area. Yeah. And she's like, what's hard is that she's like, the parents aren't able to be there. They have to go right. to work. So I'm telling like a fourth grader and a third grader how to, how to switch tabs and right. trying to explain tech to, to children. Cause there is no parent there constantly. And she's like, and then I'm getting judged by people saying, oh, there's no parent, well, but they have to work. And, right. And you start realizing all of the things like parent, not everybody has COVID leave or right. paid time off. And or again, or works for themselves uh -huh. or, you know, all, all kinds of uh, ways that, you know, we've been able to be, some of us have been able to be flexible to other people, those opportunities aren't afforded to them. And yeah. so again, I feel like it usually comes, we have to come at it with like, well, how can we be? First, sensitive, and mm -hmm. second, creative. Yeah. First, sensitive, and second, creative. Um, because I, I also think that um, in this new distance learning model, though, in some ways, it's revolutionized, you know, what we considered immutable about yeah. education, right? Exactly. <laughs> about the education system. It's revolutionized it. Like, never once would we believe that every student would be at home Yes. Uh, learning from a computer like it never it wasn't in our imagination and i i've been talking in different kinds of education communities about well what can we lean into in this opportunity because in a distance learning model there are some things that become more equitable really okay right so if you think about it because like look at particular school districts or even individual schools that really suffer greatly mm -hmm. um compared to other environments or other schools well you know, you might say the, this school community has access to better teachers or back access to better curriculum. Well, in an online model, it's all. Yeah, I mean, yeah. well, really, everybody could have access to the best teacher, or yeah. everybody. Could have, so, you know, a, again, I just think that we've been trying to survive it, 
Yeah. But, you know, in a little bit of the aftermath, if we can kind of look back and reflect and say, well, gosh, you know, what were this, the, what were the new opportunities that were created in this mm -hmm. situation um, that we could try to carry forward in some sort of new way uh, that, could, that could ultimately also help improve equity? Again, I think students have to get back to school so that we have that fundamental access you baseline. Know, baseline. Yeah. Um, but, but maybe there's you know, additional kinds of tutoring offerings or other things that could be thought of now um, because we've, we've had this experience of test running it for everybody to be online. I think personally, I, I think that would be great. And I think that looking at how it is affected and focusing on equity, not equality. Like I think right. equity is, I think they're both important, but yes. I think when we're navigating privilege, equity kind of is more, right. is more important because exactly. you want everybody to have access, access to, to the information and be able to learn. Because where many minorities have been held back and over all the years of slavery and enslavement yeah. and all that is that they weren't allowed to learn. So now let's, if we're allowing everybody to learn, let's also realize that this area might need a little extra help in terms of maybe they need more hotspots for our internet. Maybe they need right. more teachers. Maybe they need to continue some distance tutoring or right. this, so that they have the same equitable situation as a society that can afford tutors, can afford all of the after school programs and help and testing help and all of those things that, and I mean, I was lucky to have them. Right. I feel very blessed, but I was also very lucky to be able to go to college and, right. and do that's, that's my privilege. Right. And so when you were saying like, about like race and class, like I'm a minority, but my class was in a different place where I could actually do those, I had those opportunities. Exactly. And so, um, you know, I have a couple of ebooks on Amazon, race, class, and parenting ebooks. And the next one um, that is basically finished, I'm just kind of doing a little editing, it'll be out mm -hmm. soon, is on unpacking social privilege. And so, really talking about this, because I do think that obviously, in the context of the things that we've experienced recently as a society, there's a great emphasis on race um, as, you know, one measure of privilege. But in fact, there are many different kinds of privilege. Uh, and, and how is it that we're going to frame privilege responsibly for our children? Yeah. And so that's really what this uh, book is about. I've got like three uh, anecdotes that I'm sharing. And of course, you know, there's you know, limitations to anecdote. When I share a story about my life, it's not like the gospel truth, but an anecdote, anecdote is something that gives us color on a situation. And it mm -hmm. kind of really like teases us away from just stereotypes and generalizations. And we see the nuances of things, like when I tell you stories from my life experience. And so I have a couple of different stories in there where I am kind of explaining on the one hand that, um, you know, race is not always as protective as we assume. Yeah. Race, uh, the, the advantages that you have in other areas can really offset the disadvantages that are presented by you know, race or other kinds of social disadvantage. It's just a complicated and dynamic kind of thing. And so for our kids, we want to teach them not to, to the best of our ability, not to refract their life experience through the prism of their disadvantage. Yes. We all have advantages and we all have disadvantages. And with small children, like in the workshops I do, I talk about a privileged piggy bank. See. So, you know, up. you have different things that you are putting into your piggy bank different kinds of advantages and experiences that are earned or unearned that give you uh, opportunity and leverage. You have different kinds of uh, experiences and identities in this social context that may withdraw from your social yeah. piggy bank, but you kind of see that it's dynamic. And in general, when you have privilege, it's like you have an excess uh, in your piggy bank despite the withdrawals. So we're called to leverage that ex excess on behalf of other people. Like, that's what it is. It's like, can you use the extra money in your piggy bank to make a loan to someone who doesn't have as much a resource in their piggy bank? 
But these are small ways of thinking about it, but ways that we as parents first have to really understand and internalize so that we can, again, frame these conversations responsibly. Because at, we can at once talk about where we have disadvantage, but it's always, always, always relative. Always, always relative. Oh. Well, I was, I was discussing, um, a couple of close friends of mine just had baby boys, um, and they were nervous. They're like, well, I'm having a black baby boy in this time. And there was definitely nerves. But in our conversation, they're like, but okay, let me think, like, I have this level, like, so my experience is going to be different than my son's experience. Like, right. we're in a different area. Like, one of them grew up very poor. She is no longer poor. Right. Like, there are different things. I'm like, she's like, I don't want to put my experience on them. I want them to know my experience. But I don't want to say, Oh, you're a black boy. So you're going to have a hard life here in America. Exactly. Because exactly. She's like, how does my child how does my child overcome that if that's what I'm feeding into them? But she's like, but that's also what society is feeding in. So right. Like, how do I balance that? So, yeah, I actually feel like my highest responsibility, I am a mother of two black children, mm -hmm. and my highest responsibility is to protect the garden of their subconscious mind. So what I mean by that is, you know, we have our conscious level of processing but we have our subconscious mind that's really greatly impacted by our system of belief that we're born into, yes. okay? And so it is my job, especially for children of color, because this is the difference in the vulnerability, is that they are getting messaging about their unequal status mm -hmm. from different environments through different experiences. So it's like, I need to kind of double down on the affirmations for them. I need to protect them even more from this kind of messaging. I need to put in an additional effort because that's where the vulnerability lies. At the end of the day, all humans are going to face a uh, challenge and are going to have to be creative and make opportunities for themselves. It's harder when you have this baggage. <laughs> like like that's, that's what, you know, to me, the difference between the privilege and the disadvantage, the social privilege and social disadvantage is that the people with the social disadvantage have this additional vulnerability and this additional baggage and this additional hurdle, mental and emotional hurdle to get over. But I can disrupt that as a parent. I can disrupt that. And so that's kind of an empowered perspective on this is saying like, well, gosh, I can make sure that, um, you know, in their house, there are books, a wide variety of books that are reflecting characters that look like them who are having a variety of experiences. Mm -hmm. I can make sure that they are seeing, you know, positive and constructive images. I can create for them jars of affirmations. I can keep them away from certain kinds of messaging. I can make sure that they're not being exposed to even stories and narratives of, of injustice that are developmentally inappropriate. Because if you get that before you know, we, there are certain things that we shouldn't be exposing our children to until they have the maturity and the sophistication and they're at a level of development to really explore that. Yeah. So those are all part of what we need to do. And it's not about me trying to project my experience. I'm trying to manifest a different world <laughs> for my children than the one that I was in. And how can I move forward if I'm just fixated on the past that's already happened? You know what? My dad always says that because obviously i i started this and i talk a lot about bias and a lot about the past and like related to country music and how um enslavement changed things and he's always like yes focus on the past in one area he's like but also realize how far we've come realize the future realize that even what you're doing wasn't allowed before so like you you have to also think right. all of the good things that have happened he's like or else you are matching an energy that is beneath you. And he's like, you want to exactly. raise your vibration to like elevate. That's what we're trying, trying to say, do. Like elevate the conversation. We're... And this, obviously, it's somebody who was, my dad was raised in segregation in the South. And, and so he had a lot of negativity towards it. But he's like, well, when you talk to him about it, he doesn't sound mad. He's like, that was the time. That right. was the time. He's like, I don't live in that time anymore. It's right. like you are a product of something of not at that time. Your mother is white. Like you, we broke that. Right. So we're not going to harbor on that. We're going to acknowledge the history. Right. But we're not going to bring that into our present moment, which I and, think was a very big blessing for me as, okay. a, as a woman to know, like, that is a trauma. 
Right. But he healed from that in the sense of like, he's like, I am not going to bring that into your world. Exactly. That's not the world that you need to see. Exactly. And so that again, it's, and it's, and it's a, it takes an effort. It takes yeah. an effort to kind of move beyond that. And, and I do see it as all of us, you know, individually, we are trying to raise our vibrations, you know, but really also as a collective society, yes. that's what we're trying to do. And so um, I think that your dad would be a person who I would say, uh, you know, has, has an understanding of the difference between the truth and the way things appear. Like for me, I do feel like a lot of this racial reconciliation is um, in some ways a foregone conclusion. Okay. And I think when we look at someone, a great leader like MLK, I was talking about this, I was on a, a segment for MLK Day, I was saying, like, I think what's so beautiful about his, uh, his work and the, the, the stuff that he said, it, he really always was committed to a vision of the, the end state. Yes. He was always committed to the vision of the end state. He saw it, it was in his spirit. He was committed to that vision. And so what we need right now, are people who can lead us who are committed to that vision of the end state and can see the difference between truth and the way things appear. You know, uh, we just had the anniversary of Ahmaud Arbery's uh, passing, just, yeah. you know, his death and his murder a couple days ago. That's a day in our history that was, the appearance is very different from the truth of where we're headed and who we can be. Yes. Um, and so it takes a lot of strength to look beyond that, to look beyond those kinds of injustices when they happen, with, you know, like what happened. But that's what we are called to do, I think, especially as parents, <laughs> especially yes. as parents, because so much of our children's experience is riding on our capacity to do that. Okay, that, that would lead me to ask you, in shielding like our children, and like for me, like my nieces and my nephews and my godchildren, like where, is the appropriate line when when like media and everything is like hyper focused on on black death and and black crime and even with the black lives matter protests which i think were beautiful yeah the focus was like oh they burned something or this right like, how do you how do you shield but still acknowledge that there is a there is a lot going on there right. is like a, a movement but you don't need to see all of this movement. Like, right, does that make right, sense? right. And I think that's kind of where, you know, obviously the wisdom and the prudence comes in. And I, so my second ebook was on five strategies for discussing social injustice with kids. So kind of talking about just this. And I think the first thing is before you start introducing these um, conversations about these experiences of injustice, the, the first question is, do your children already own multiple narratives of the marginalized or oppressed group that you're trying to talk about? First, okay, <laughs> first. Regardless of, you know, the race or the identity of the children, you know, before I talk to my child about, you know, the experience of George Floyd, is she aware of the entire spectrum of kind of experiences in black bodies in this country and beyond this country? Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, you're going to dehumanize Black people by just introducing these negative narratives or these experiences of oppression. It's dehumanizing. Nobody experiences only oppression. Yes. Nobody experiences only disempowerment. But yes. if you want to actually develop empathy, I have to see you completely and fully as a person first for me to really understand the injustice yes. and the harm. So I think that's kind of the first thing. I think also just using basic wisdom about, you know, what is excessively violent? Like we wouldn't take our children to see a rated R film. Yeah. So they probably don't need to see the video of George Floyd, you know, like that same kind of uh, meter stick mm -hmm. that we would use um, to, to protect our children from things that are developmentally inappropriate because of how it can impact them emotionally and psychologically. Mm -hmm. This is a similar kind of um, litmus test that we can use. Uh, for these kinds of conversations. But I think as after they already own multiple narratives of this particular group, and also in the context of black lives in particular, I think it's important for children to know that other people besides black people have experienced oppression. Because <laughs> that's also part of the humanizing. Like there are many different kinds of moments of oppression, of inequality. Um, there's different 
forms and brands of suffering among yeah. different kinds of people here. And I think that's important too, because this is also part of our human experience. And so I think those things would help to, um, I guess, you know, help them to receive that in a way where they can process it critically mm -hmm. and it wouldn't be as damaging. I get that. Yeah. I, I know, and I've been doing it for, for so long when I, when a friend has a baby or I give a gift to somebody, I always give multicultural dolls or I give books, but they're not always, I do believe in books that teach about anti-racism, things right. like that. But I also believe in just a book where the characters are happen to be black. Right. Happen like to they be. don't have to, like in their living their lives and just right. doing their thing. And, and one of the blessings I feel from my childhood is that my grandmother adopted my sister and my brother from Korea. My, oh. like my grandma looks like Julie Andrews. Like <laughs> I didn't realize I was like black until I was older. Like, like I didn't even, we discussed race, but I didn't understand all the things. I just thought people were people. Right. For, and I, and that is also a privilege that I was able to live in a bubble where I didn't have to be confronted by my race. Right. On a daily right. basis. But also I was surrounded by other ethnicities. Right. in my family, in right. my own house, which I think was awesome. Yeah. Awesome. And now, and I realized how much that helped me as an adult realize, oh, like, yeah, this has happened. And we learned about like everything that happened with internment camps. We learned yeah. about stuff that's happened in enslavement. We learned to say ens enslaved instead of slave. Like right. they didn't choose it, but like, this right. is, was also those aren't the only people that have ever been enslaved, like right. other races were. And so I think that helped me. And so I always say, that's what I want to give to the children that are in my life is right. just to see everybody as a full human. That's exactly as it. A full human. Cause I'm like, I, my story of, I read a thing about like my parents love story is just as much black history mm -hmm. as, as a protest. Like it's okay. still our history. It's just different. It's just the, the good part. I can focus on both. Exactly. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I would say, you know, you could be aware of both and you could choose to focus on the better part of that. Yeah, <laughs> I would I'm take like, it a step further. I'm you like, know? I want to know my history. I want everybody to know it, but not take the trauma from it. Right. Like, and right. that's where. And I, I think know. also it's like, and you have to push forward, like, why do we want to know this? I, I had a chance to write an article on actionable ways to celebrate Black History Month. And I think mm -hmm. my point is that we're not trying to, um, you know, raise these narratives to evoke pity for Black mm -hmm. people or to evoke guilt. These are learning lessons for how we can become better as individuals and better as a society. And it's yes. actually to take this as a lesson that's supposed to be more broadly applicable. Yes. <laughs> those, that's what those stories, the purpose of those stories really is. So I think again, a lot of it comes back to like, do I understand my own intentions mm -hmm. in the choices that I'm making for myself and for my children and constantly like reflecting and asking yourself like, well, what's the, what's the end state? What's my vision? What's my vision for my family? And so, you know, as I'm selecting to talk about this or, you know, not talk about this yet, that's all part of the intentional movement towards what it is that I want for myself, my family, my community. See, I love that. And I always, I, I've been saying a lot, like, I want to know history so that I don't repeat history, not to right. wallow in my history. Exactly. I just think you learn so you don't repeat. And exactly. for a long time, we weren't able to, to learn it. Like it was changed in the books and all. The, so now right. we have access. We, still, we have, a, we have people at different levels right now, yeah. which is interesting. People who are just starting to learn people who have learned and need to step forward um, mm -hmm. from that from that knowledge to, you know, how do we translate this into different kind of action or a different kind of manifestation? And then people who are, you know, kind of leading the way on it. Yeah, it's, I think we are in a, a beautiful time. I know um, it is a different time, pandemics, <laughs> homeschooling, all these things, Zooms for right. days. But I also think that the humanness and interconnectivity that we are intersecting mm -hmm. is long overdue 
Yeah. It's long overdue for us to be having conversations and to be discussing the future. The future being children, the future being what their lives could look like, the possibilities, instead of being like, oh, right. this is their ceiling. It's, it's so, it's the time to think, oh, we can, they can be anything. They right. can be anything and they can live in a world that is a world that we haven't even experienced. Exactly. That's, that's what we should be doing. Yeah. <laughs> that's our role. That's our role. That's our role. That's our role. And so I, I feel personally um, blessed that you are, are here holding space with me for these kind of conversations. And I definitely want to post links to your books because I do believe that you are working on a path that is, that can bless a lot of people and can help us heal but also empower our right. empower the next generation because the, what they are going to be able to accomplish i can't even imagine like no it, the future is bright and i think again what you're saying to me is in alignment with my own view and i always describe myself as being ruthlessly optimistic and i say ruthless optimism is my superpower and i think that's what is differentiating me in these dialogues right now mm -hmm. is um you know you know, when you're in a space that you're called for, when there's a challenge and you see opportunity. Yes. Okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you see opportunity. It's like there, you know, I can get into the kitchen with a bunch of ingredients and I just see a mess. There are some people who their talent and their calling is cooking and they see opportunity. They see spices, they see possibilities. You know what I mean? Like that's their, that's their gift. They're in their flow. They're, the challenge has met their skill. And so I think, again, for me right now, I just see this where, like yourself, you've had a very, um, in many ways, non-traditional upbringing, yeah. where you have a, a multiracial family. Um, you know, I also, like I said, I moved, I moved 13 times when I was growing up. We lived in nine different states. At one point, I was the only black child in the school district. My dad is from West Africa. My mom is from Mississippi. When I was 15, I um, started my professional international soccer career. So then I ended up, you know, from then I traveled around the world. I ended up going to college in New York City, one of the most diverse places. And now I live in LA, another really diverse place. So I just feel like, um, you know, when, you start to realize like, gosh, I, I, um, I'm kind of a natural sociologist. Yes, I've been around a lot of different kinds of people. I've had many different opportunities to work through many different things because of that. And again, that's a privilege as you described it yourself um, that I need to leverage into uh, opportunities for other people. Yes, spending our privilege is, right. is I am finding it not only healing for me, but empowering. Because I'm like, I can say things that are digestible to certain people that somebody else might not be able to. Right. Just because of where I was raised and the schooling I've had and the, the tone of my voice and right. the way I speak. It's just, right. I understand all of that plays a part in my communication towards different people of different classes. Right. And there are some places where they wouldn't respond to me. And I'm aware right. of those voices for that. Right. There are voices and platforms and people that are better at that. I'm good at like this yeah. line. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You find like, what's your space? And you realize, okay, but this is, you know, and I think in my first uh, ebook, I talk about finding the shape of your allyship. And oh, shape yeah. is an acronym. And it's your spiritual gifts, your heart's passion, your abilities, your personality, and your experiences. And so again, we're all kind of called to sit with who we are and what we've been through. And then that's going to really dictate what it looks like, like the role that we're going to play in bringing about a more equitable society. Yeah. You and I may be kind of more aligned in our communication styles and what it is that we can do, but there are some people who it's going to look totally different you know, yeah. what role they're going to play. Some people are going to be writing. Some people are artists. Some people are, you know, um, activists, like, you know, who want to march. You know, it's, so everybody has to think through who they are. And it's not about judging each other. There's a reason why we're all created differently. We all have a role to play. And I just see, like, I just want to empower people to kind of find what that role is for themselves. Mm -hmm. Because that's where we get 
meaning and purpose out of our life experience. Yes. <laughs> That's yes. where we get meaning and purpose out of our life experience. We are all here to bring about the next stage of development. Yes. And if you don't know what that next stage looks like, and you don't know what you're supposed to be doing, what your contribution is to that next stage, then it's unfortunate. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but you have the ability to learn. I always say, exactly. you have the ability to, to find out. And that's, and, that's exactly and, it. And, and then for everybody to just, you know, again, like I said, see it that way. That's mm -hmm. how we need to see it. And that's how we need to frame it in a constructive way. And I know that there's so many, um, I guess, hesitancies, or there's lack of understanding, there's um, confusion, there's, uh, you know, competitiveness, there's all kinds of things that are limiting our view to see that kind of we're all in this together. And we're trying to move, like I said, all of us collectively need to go together to the next stage to the higher vibration. Um, and, and, and that's what this is really about. That's what this life journey is about. This whole life journey. And I love, I mean, I, it's, I, I always say it's a little crazy to say, but I'm, I'm happiest when I'm learning. I'm yes. happiest when I'm trying to be better and trying to empower the people around me and realize that is the only control I have is to help right. myself learn and be better and not judge, not judge right. people for where they are. And right. I, I, cause I have no control over that. I have control over what comes out of my mouth and what comes through my heart. Right. And I and that's think how even you've parenting, like, as long as everything is done with love and intention and, and purity, right. That kids feel that kids, right. kids know, know that if nothing right. else, they know purity and love and that energy. And, and it's okay energy. to have that transparency. It's imperfect progress. I always say yeah. allyship is like a yoga practice. You don't go to one yoga class and then you're a yogi. Yeah. You know, it doesn't work that way. No. And that's why I think Bob Marley is like, love is my religion. It's a practice like a religion to want to learn to love. Mm -hmm. And so we grow and we have different opportunities to learn to love on a daily basis. And we can be transparent with our children, especially as they get older, about what that process looks like so that they can see you have to be vulnerable enough because that's where the authenticity comes in. Yes. You know, hey, I didn't know this. You know, I said this. I didn't mean to offend this person, you know, I, you know, I'm, I'm just now coming into this knowledge, you know, my children realize I, I just learned this today. Hey guys, you know, you're, you're much younger. There's not an expectation for you to know everything. There's just that I expect you to desire to know. And I expect you to desire to try to love and try to find your purpose. I love that. I love that. Oh, well, I will, I will end on that because that's just, Beautiful, beautiful. Oh, <laughs> and I'm excited for your next ebook. Um, I have the first two, and oh. I, I share them often. But I will also share them on this because I think that they are empowering. I and think you will. Um, I don't want to give away the farm for the next one, but I think there are some powerful stories in this next ebook, um, and it will reveal a lot more about my own personal lived experience. I'm vulnerable in a way that I haven't been before. And, uh, but I think that it's in service to a lot of people um, to share the fullness of these stories. So um, I will get on getting that out. Yes, get so on. I'm everyone... excited for you to be continue being vulnerable because in your vulnerability, I personally have a chance to learn and that yeah. makes me smile because I think if everybody could be vulnerable, how much we all would learn about one another and also realize how similar we right. all are. There is a through right. line between it all is. of us. There are far more similarities than differences. Right. Which is why I always joke and say, I've learned to hate everyone equally. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to use that. I'm gonna use yes. That. yes. <laughs> I just want to say thank you so much for leveraging your platform and for using your voice and creating these opportunities uh, for conversation and for dialogue. And it's, it's a beautiful thing what you're doing. Thank and you. I, you know, I see and feel your love and wisdom. And I appreciate that. Thank you. I appreciate you saying that. I, as, as some know, I post, I've, I've gotten some pushback from some people and listen, and you got it. I know my boundaries and I know my intention in doing it. And that's, um, it's, that's it's, all I can control. 
Right. It's a yeah. process. I definitely get all kinds of responses to the content that I post. Yeah. Okay. So, and, and that's okay. Um, what I would encourage you, like from one person, one kind of love warrior to another okay. is, you know, take the time to, to, to do the more self-care and like find a committed um, regular self-care process so that you keep yourself in an emotional state where you're far from being triggered because it is heavy work. Yes. And so you don't even really realize the you're that in this process you're really carrying so much you're doing more than your share. Yeah. In this process emotionally. So it's going to take that reinvestment, that constant reinvestment in that space um to to care for yourself. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. I I am finding the need to do that more. So I feel like <laughs> yeah. that was also the universe reminding me like, "Hey, yeah. <laughs> you need to do that because yeah. I don't want to be triggered. I always want to move in love and move right. in compassion and empathy. Because I think that's where people, people hear. People right. don't hear in anger. It's, right. it's not when people listen. It's not when exactly. kids listen. It's not when exactly. 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 <laughs> All righty. I will save this on this page. So anybody that oh, it can perfect. watch. And then Great. I'll also um, send you a copy so you can share. Awesome. Well. Thank you. I will definitely uh, share it in my content uh, too. Uh, all, All right. right. Well, I have love a great you. day. And have a beautiful Friday. It's Friday. Yes. It's almost the weekend. So yes, <laughs> <laughs> weekend in the pandemic, almost a year in. We got exactly. this. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Say hi to the family for me. I will. I will. Thank you so much, Stephanie. You're welcome. I love you. Bye. -bye.